Hi, my name is Carlton Skovia Nakamia and welcome to Her Story with Carlton. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, just go click the subscription button and like the Facebook page Carlton's Room for more and very exciting and motivational uh, episodes of Her Story with Carlton. Now, today I'm hosting a very intellectual person and that is Dr. Victoria Nalle. Can you imagine having a PhD at 29 years? That is very, very exciting. So she's going to be telling us more about this, the journey she has been through, how she has made it to, to where she is, and why she has interest in oil and gas. Welcome, Dr. Victoria Nalle. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Okay, what was your background like? So I grew up in a family of five, four mm. girls and one boy. Mm. And um, I went, first and foremost, I went to some schools. There weren't some very, very good schools. Uh, I remember I had my grandmother in Mobende. So for primary, I partly went to Mobende in boarding. Because at that time, my family was struggling financially. Yeah, so I went to a school in Mobende, Mobende district. It was called Kakendo. And then thereafter, I, I didn't finalize my P7 from there. Mm. I finalized from St. Joseph in, in, in Kaboso, okay. along Kaboso. Mm. So my childhood was a bit, it wasn't so challenging, but mm. my family, it didn't have, they didn't have enough money. Mm. And what then, do you call enough money? Uh, like to take me to very good schools at that moment. Yeah, like mm. Green Hill or what. Those were your dream schools. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But uh, at the end of the day, it really worked out because it it shows that it doesn't matter where you study from. It's all about the passion to make it in life. Because sometimes people are discouraged. They're like, I'm from a very bad school. I'm from a village school. Will I ever make it in life? At the end of the day, it's the passion. So with that background, knowing that I in my primary schools I didn't go to those nice schools. I was still passionate, but things changed definitely. So for secondary, I went to St. Lawrence, yes. and then um, for my A level, I went to Cambodia, okay. and then there afterwards, I got interest in law. I, uh, so I joined Uganda Christian University. I, um, as a law student, I graduated, and then I did you my. You did law. Yes, I did law. Yeah. Okay. And I went for the diploma in legal practice at the Law Development Center here okay. in Makerere. Mm. And so during that time, I used Before to... Before we go that mm. far, how did life turn around? Yes, how did life turn around to go into the energy sector? No, mm. no, from that poor background. My, my dad life worked... in Mobende yes. and then you're back to the city. Yeah, the, my dad worked hard afterwards because there's no permanent situation in life. Mm -hmm. He's a very hardworking person and he's one of the people who really inspire me. Mm. I look at his journey okay. as a person. Definitely I wouldn't want to talk about his journey now because it's about me, but yes. it's because of his journey and I see where he came from, mm. how he fought, mm. how he was determined mm. and passionate to make sure that he makes it and he provides a good education for his children. So that inspired me. So They, they, they normally say it is the primary mm. education that's really important. It's the foundation that mm. gives, that makes you who you are. Yeah. Did the foundation you got from Movende mm. make the person of Nalule we see now? It's not the foundation. The foundation is important, but it's also the passion. Because we've seen many people who are very successful right now and they don't have that good background. Mm -hmm. The foundation is important, but it's not like a role that if you went in a very good school for mm. your primary, you will make it in life. Mm. And it, it's also not the same to say that if you went in a very bad school in your primary school, you will not make it. Mm. It's really the passion you have as a person, the determination, and that belief in yourself. Mm. Like It doesn't matter where I'm coming from, mm. I'll still make it in life. Okay. Yeah. So tell us that type of environment that you went through. Uh, I've been in a very good environment. I've been surrounded by supportive people. My family, they're very supportive. My mom, my dad, my sisters, and also friends. So it has been a supportive environment, if I may say. Mm -hmm. 
how come you got rapid academic achievements? Yes, so immediately after the Law Development Center, I proceeded to do my master's degree at the University of Dundee in Scotland. And after the master's degree, I was convinced that that's it. I'm not going to do anything else. So my okay. master's focused on oil and gas law. But then I, I was for, offered an internship in Belgium, in Brussels, okay. with a big international organization. And they were dealing with energy matters. It's called um, International Energy Charter Secretariat. It's based in Brussels, and they have over like 53, more than 53 countries who are signatories. So when I went in Brussels, I was impressed. Uh, before you go to Brussels, mm. why did you pick interest in oil and gas, doing a master's in oil uh, and gas? Okay, so um, during the time when I finalized my uh, Law Development Center, my diploma in legal practice mm. at the Law Development Center, I had applied to Birmingham University in the UK yeah. and I also got, I, I was offered a place. So I'm like, no, I have to do international criminal law because that was my passion. Okay. But then at the time I talked to my supervisor. Throughout my undergraduate at Uganda Christian University, I was working with uh, Justice Kenneth Kakuro. At that time he wasn't a justice, mm. he had his law firm. But every holiday I used to go there and work as an intern, legal assistant. Mm. So when I talked to him about writing for me a recommendation to do criminal law, he advised me, he's like, why don't you consider the energy sector? Because right now um, we, we have just discovered oil in Uganda. It might be a good place for you to consider. Okay, when was that? Uh, that was 2012. Okay. Yes. And also, after LDC, we have that period of clerkship for three months. So I did my clerkship at the Anti-Corruption Court of Uganda. And at that time, I was under the supervision of Justice Catherine Bamgemereire. She was at the Anti-Corruption Court. And she also told me the same thing. So I had like Going two... Going to oil and gas. Yes, just like there is a lot of potential. You should think about it. You ventured. Yes. And my dad told me the same thing. So I listened. I listened to these three people I respect a lot. Mm. And I took that road and I never looked back. Okay. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's listening to people, listening to your mentors, mm. listening to your parents. Mm. And you consider it. So that was it. So when they told me, mm. I changed from Birmingham. Then I applied to the University of Dundee. Okay, <laughs> so didn't you feel like, no, these people are making me abandon my dream of criminal law, you know? No, at the end of the day, it's law, and for me, criminal law, I wanted to do criminal law because of, I wanted to focus on international criminal law. I wanted to work with the International Criminal, criminal Court, Court, yes, in, at the Hague, yes. Yes. But then I also looked at the energy sector. It has uh, an international perspective in it. Mm. So I weighed my options. I'm like, I can still do the energy sector, and I think it has potential. And the more I read about it, the more I fell in love with the sector. You did your master's, mm. and then? And then I went to Brussels now. That's mm. where everything turned around. Because after my master's, I was convinced that this is it for me. OK. Yeah, I don't want to do any further education. I should just think about marriage and kids. You so, are tired of books? No, I felt that was enough at that time. I felt it was enough. You've made it. I've made it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then I went to the Energy Charter Secretariat in Brussels. It's a big okay. organization mm. with different people, European, uh, European countries, some African countries, Asian. And I was inspired and impressed by some of the colleagues I met there, young girls, and were already doing their PhD. I remember my first friend was called Eleni. She was from Greece. Mm. And that time she was 26. She was 26, I was 27. Mm. But she was already a PhD candidate. Okay. So I'm like, what? what? You, a young lady, think about a PhD. So I got inspired and I worked really hard. And my supervisor at that time, he was called Dr. Nesto Panafi. He noticed how hard I was working. So he advised me, he's like, Victoria, why don't you think about doing a PhD? Mm. 
because you're doing very good work, but if you're to stay in international organizations, you have to be competitive. And most of the people had, had PhDs. So um, I thought about it for some time, and then I started applying for a PhD. Yeah, because I've always wanted to work with international organizations. So I'm like, I really need to compete. So <laughs> that's it. So you went for it? I went for it. How was it like? Uh, the journey, it's challenging. It's not for faint-hearted people. Because most of the time you're on your own. It's more an independent research. And, but at the end of the day, it's the time you give to your PhD studies. Because I must say I'm one of the few people who finalized my PhD on time. I finalized in less than three years. Because most people can take like five years or seven years. But I sat down, mm. I noticed I really want to do this, and I don't want to spend five years working on this. So I set targets as a person. I'm like, at least every day I have to write like 500 words. And my writing every wasn't day. every day, 500. Writing what? 500 words about your research. Okay. Yeah, because PhD is about writing. You have to come up with a thesis at the end of the day. So I set my targets. I will feel I, um, I faced some challenges, but I kept encouraging myself. My family used to encourage me, and then my friends, because at that moment you need very, very good friends, mm. people who are positive. You don't need to have Not a lot of negativity. Say, Why are you doing a PhD yes. at your age? Yes. You I had such people. people. <laughs> I had, had such them. people. Yes, and then I just blocked them. I'm like, I don't need this kind of energy right now. Okay, you know. Okay. So you really need to choose your friends very carefully because mm. you don't need someone who's going to discourage you. It's already a stressing process, so you don't need more stress from people. Yeah. So it's important you pick very good supervisors, mm. very good mentors, and then stay close with relatives who are supportive. Those ones who are not supportive, you have to distance yourself. And then okay. friends, you also pick friends who are supportive. And you set a target, you're like, I'm going to do this. And then you believe in yourself, because we all have that ability. But some of us, we nev some people never really realize how far they can go, because mm. they never give it a try. Mm. Yeah. So when, when you say, hey, she's a doctor, yeah. a PhD holder, mm. in what? In International Energy Loan Policy. That's very powerful. <laughs> Thank you. It is. So, how many books have you written so far? Uh, so far, there are two books that are published, and then one is in progress. It will be published uh, next year. And I intend to write more. More? Yeah, because I feel like as Africans, it's time for us to write our history. Because in most cases, like historically, we didn't have enough knowledge, so mm -hmm. most of the things were written for us, mm -hmm. but from someone else's perspective of life. So it's time for us to take control, you know, influence other people, motivate other people, and believe that we can do this. Tell us about the day your supervisor told you, yes, you've made it, you've mm. successfully completed your PhD. Mm. How did it appear like? I was happy, I was happy. Mm. And because my supervisor was very supportive, he's called Professor Peter Cameron. Okay. He's Scottish and he's the director of the Center for Energy, Petroleum Land Policy at the University of Dundee. So I was lucky that before he supervised me for the PhD, he was already he had supervised me for my masters. Okay. So when I told him I wanted to do a PhD, he was very supportive. Mm. He wrote the necessary recommendation letters. Mm. And at the time I started, I wasn't a good writer. Honestly, I wouldn't say I could write as an expert. Mm. I was just learning. Mm. But he was very patient with me. And he's one of the people, besides my Ugandan mentors and family in Europe, he's one of the people who really and truly believed in me. Whenever I was stressed, you know, the, those moments when you start doubting yourself, you're like, why am I doing this again? Okay. <laughs> He would be like, no, Victoria, I believe in you. You can do this. And you don't even need to spend all the five years doing this. You're very hardworking. He noticed my abilities at a very early stage during my master's. He noticed that I was 
passionate about the subject. So he was very encouraging throughout. Okay. Yeah. What did you promise yourself? Growing up, I always wanted to be a lawyer. And by being a lawyer, I wanted to reach out to people. So I told myself, if I ever become a prominent lawyer, I'll be helping people who have no lawyers, who, can, who cannot afford lawyers. But that's why you wanted criminal law. Yes, that's what I wanted. That's why okay. I wanted criminal law. But when things turned around and I went into energy and mining, because I, I do both energy and mining, mm. I realized I can still fulfill my dream. Okay. And so I set up an NGO. It's called the African Energy and Minerals Management Initiative. Okay. We do reach out to small scale miners. <coughs> We do provide them with equipment. So it's not like the criminal part of it, but still I'm reaching out. I'm using my expertise to be on the ground. Okay. Yeah. Finally, you have a PhD at 29 years. Hmm. What did your family tell you? You can do more. Reaction? You can do more. <laughs> they're <laughs> so supportive. Not one more step, but they're just so supportive. They're like, you're hardworking mm. and you are meant to be somewhere up there. That's the thing I said about having that inner circle that is very supportive. Because mm. all the people, not all, but the people I chose to be around me, they're very supportive, very, very supportive. Mm. So they believe I can achieve more. They believe, you know, I can take another step further. And then my dad is also so much into helping people. Mm. So he's very supportive of the NGO, of my ideas. He's like, there's a reason why God favored you. So you need to give back, like never forget. Actually, one thing he told me when I graduated is like, Victoria, it doesn't matter where you gain life, where life takes you. It doesn't matter whether you're working in European countries. Don't ever forget where you came from. 